and find that the extension of the life of parliament and local government councils as well as the re retrospective application of the said amendment are not in any way related to the objectives of the original bill. I find that it violated Rule 1 1052 of the 2012 rules, which is in parimateria with Rule 1152 of 2017 rules of Parliament, to the effect that no bill shall contain anything foreign to what its long title imports. Further, I accept the petitioner's contention that by extending their term going against Article 942 of the Constitution and Rule 934 of the 2017 rules without declaring their interests and voting on that very question. The members of parliament grossly violated the National Leadership Code of Conduct enshrined in Chapter 14 of the Constitution, which prohibit leaders, including members of parliament, from personal or, co or conflict of interest in the execution of their duties. Um, I now turn to the contention by the petitioners that Article 77.4 of the Constitution was amended by infection through the extension of the term of Parliament and local government councils. Court was referred to the minutes of the Constitution of the Constituent Assembly in support of the argument that the intention behind Article 77.4 was for members of parliament and local government councils to be subjected to elections and that in extending their term for five years from five to seven years parliament contravened article one of the constitution So I referred again to Article 1, of which provides for the sovereignty of the people and what it states from 1 to 4. Then I, it's abundantly clear that the above provisions vest power in the people, which they exercise in accordance with the Constitution. Meanwhile, Article 96 of the Constitution provides that Parliament shall stand dissolved upon the expiration of its term, as prescribed by Article 77 of the Constitution. While Article 77.3 provides for the term of Parliament as being five years, 77.4 provides an exception that this term may be extended by a resolution supported by not less than two-thirds of all members of Parliament for a period not exceeding six months at a time, where there exists a state of war or a state of emergency which would prevent a normal general election from being held. Mr. Gimara, Avad in his affidavit in Constitutional Petition 003 2018 that this parliament first sat on the 19th day of May 2016, meaning that it has to be dissolved on or before the 18th of May 2021 in accordance with Article 94. The petitioner's complaint is that by extending the term of the 10th parliament to 2023, parliament by infection amended Article 77.3, 77.4 and 96 of the Constitution. I refer to the Supreme Court Constitutional Appeal Number 1 of 202, Post Kawanga Semogere versus Attorney General. I'll note. <coughs> which in brief says that if an act had the effect of adding to, varying, or repealing any provision of the provision, then the act is said to have amended the affected article of the Constitution. And that there is no difference whether the, whether the act is an ordinary act of Parliament or an act intended to amend the Constitution. The two are treated the same as under 137.3. So that if it was to be otherwise, Parliament could alter the entire Constitution, including the entrenched provisions, without following the procedure prescribed in Chapter 18 of the Constitution, as long as it took care not to specify them in the head note of the amending Act.
relying on the principles laid down by the learned Chief Justice above, I'll consider whether, the, whether in the present case there were some amendments by infection. Article 1 and 2 of the Constitution provide that the people shall be governed through their will and consent through regular and fair elections. Mr. Mavidis described the, res the, the legislation by Parliament in which they extended their term without the people's authority, thus amending Articles 1 and 2 and 260 as colorable legislation. Court was referred to segregated again for the proposition that colorable legislation arose where a legislature lacking legislative powers or subject to a constitutional prohibition may frame its legislation so as to make it appear to be within legislative power or to be free from the constitutional prohibition. The question to ask is whether the will of the people in this case was disregarded. I shall begin by respectfully disagreeing with the respondent's contention that by voting elected representatives pursuant to articles, Article 1.4 and 38 of the Constitution, the people in effect determined their destiny through the decisions of elected representatives. The people express their will through that the people express their will through electing their representatives. However, I note that this was for a specified period of time and the constitution as the constitution, the constitution provided under Article 61. Even if the respondent's contention that the people determine their destiny through elect, uh, elected representatives is correct, it has to be restricted within the confines of the constitutional provisions. Members of parliament are indeed represent, representatives, but who were given a mandate of only five years. Anything above that would be representing the people without their will and consent. When the members of parliament are elected by the people for a period provided for under the constitution, there is thereby created that social contract. And uh, the terms cannot be unilaterally changed. I'm unable to accept the respondent's submission that by enacting sections two and six, <coughs> parliament was... Well, I find that the amendments on extension of the life of parliament and local government councils affected Article 1 by implication or infection. I therefore Article 1 deals with the sovereignty of the people. The doctrine of the sovereignty of the people was in my view compromised by those amendments in such a way that it took away the right of the people to choose who should govern them. Uh, article 1 is one of the entrenched provisions under Article 262, 262B. And an entrenched provision cannot be amended without first carrying out a referendum. There was no referendum carried out before Parliament extended their term from five to seven years. I therefore find that sections two and six of the constitution extending the term and life of parliament and that of local government councils from five to seven years is inconsistent with and in contravention of articles 1, 8A, 61, 2, 3, 7, 7, 3, and all of those others mentioned in the constitution. As to the retrospective application, uh, the gist of the petitioner's contention was that by providing that the extended the seven-year term takes effect from the current, current parliament, the said sections in essence rendered the act applicable in a retrospective manner, which, is, which in their view contravened Article 1, 8, 8, 8A, 77, 774, 79, 96, and a host of others. The petitioner's contention, as I understood it, emanated from the wording of Section 8, which amended Article 289. 
of the Constitution that provides for the current term of Parliament to expire after seven years of its first sitting after the general elections. And Section 10, which amended Article 291, um, to make the same, the same provision for the current local government councils. It was contended that the retrospective application of the law had deprived the people of their right to elect new leaders and provide accountability at the end of their term, contrary to the directive principles of, of state policy, specifically National Objective um, 16, and in contra contravention of those articles which were already mentioned. I reiterate my earlier findings on issues one and three in respect of the effect of the amendment on Article 1, 2, and 4, 79 and 259, as I agree with the petitioner's submission that the tenets of the rule of law include, among others, good governance and compliance with the democratic principles of law and the right of the people to determine how they should be governed, uh, which is the import of Article 1, 2 of the Constitution. And since I have already found under issue one and three that the amendments complained of were inconsistent with and or in contravention of the stated provisions of the Constitution, it goes without saying that the retrospective application of the same enactments becomes unconstitutional to and contrary to Article 1. I will not make reference to the articles in the Constitution because my brother, the ones which allow for retrospective application, my brother Chiborion dealt with them. So I'll go to issue six, issues 5 and 6C. I'll, for convenience, I shall consider both issues, number 5 and 6C, together. Whether the alleged violence cut for inside and outside Parliament during the enactment of the Act was inconsistent and in contravention of Article 1, 2, 3, 2, and 8A of the Constitution, 6C says uh, whether the actions of Uganda People's Defence Forces and Uganda Police in entering Parliament allegedly assaulting members in the Chamber, Arresting and allegedly detaining the said members is inconsistent with and in contravention of Articles 24, 97, 208, 2, and 2113. As I said, I'm not referring to the submissions. The parties know what they submitted in respect of each issue. Um, I'll just go to my resolution. I said I reviewed the affidavit of Jeno Mohozi and I respect, re respectfully disagree with Mr. Mavili's submission and prayer to expand some of the paragraphs therefrom. Jeno Mohozi stated his source of information and during cross-examination he explained that he was watching the events as they transpired in, in the, on camera and he was also briefed by his subordinate commander of that day. I've also carefully evaluated evidence on record relating to the events that transpired in Parliament during the proceedings of 21st, 26th, and 27th, attached to the affidavits of Jenny Chivirike, the clerk to Parliament, and Ahmed Kagoye, the sergeant at arms. I've also considered the affidavit evidence of Honorable Betty Namboze and her evidence during cross-examination. It is evident from the Hansard and the affidavit evidence that repeated calls were made by the right honorable speaker of parliament to maintain order to members to maintain order and decorum and allow the debate process to proceed on page 4702, for example, I'll just read out a few of what she said. She 
said, the speaker said, Honorable Sawanyana, please sit down. Order. Can I request Honorable Chibule to exit the chamber? Then Mr. Rukutana said something. This is a well orchestrated plan to stifle business of the House. Speaker went on to say, Honorable Members, can you take your seats? Order. Members, take your seats. First, take your seats. Minister, please proceed. Then, as the minister was proceeding, there was this order again. Then the speaker again called on the members, please take your seats. Honorable Samuju, take your seat. Honorable members, the word parliament comes from the French word palais, which means the place where you speak. Therefore, let us speak with our mouths, not fists. Please, it's part of parliamentary etiquette to listen to each other. And I had invited the minister to speak. And again, as the minister stood up to speak, I think there was another scuffle. The speaker says, Honorable Sawanyana, can you please either take your seat or get out? Members, please take your seats. Then the minister continues to speak. Speaker, Honorable Members, I would like to remind you that you are here on behalf of your people. The minister is giving information. Please take your seats. So this type of conduct continued for quite some time with the speaker imploring members to observe order. On the 27th day of September 2017, the speaker had this to say. At the sitting yesterday, the unreal conduct of last week was repeated. The speaker could not be heard in silence. Members were standing, climbing on chairs and tables, and they were dressed in a manner that violates Rule 73 of our Rules of Procedure. I made several calls to the members to sit down and be orderly, but this was not adhered to. Some members crossed from one side to the other in a menacing manner, contrary to Rule 74 of the Rules of Procedure. The Speaker could not address the House in silence, as many members were menacingly standing near the Speaker's chair. So the Speaker then proceeded under Rule 72 of the Rules of the Procedure, which enjoins that to pre preserve order and decorum in the House and Rule 77, 79, 2, and 80 to name and order the immediate withdrawal from the house of any member whose conduct is grossly disorderly and to suspend any misbehaving member. She named 25 members of parliament and invited them to exit the house. She invited the sergeant at arms to remove them and suspended the house for 30 minutes for the sergeant at arms to do his work. What happened during the eviction can be gleaned from the interjection by interjection of Honorable Winfred Chiza who stated, Madam Speaker, I can just not just pretend that life is as usual. I cannot pre pretend that it's business as usual. What has just happened to members in this chamber, Madam Speaker, is something we should not ignore. Members were brutally moved out of chambers by the SFC and so on, so on. It, ap it appears not to be in dispute, therefore, that on 27th, the Right Honorable Speaker made the order to the sergeant at arms to cause the removal of those 25 people who, in the opinion of the speaker, had become unruly. Um, which would have caused on the 26th of September, the Honorable Speaker suspended the house for 30 minutes. What I'm, I'm able to discern from the affidavit evidence on record is that in the process of execution of the order of the speaker, there was a scuffle arising out of failure by the named members to exit, which could have caused their forceful eviction by the staff of the sergeant of arms and security officers who caused the members of parliament subsequent arrest and detention. In light of the foregoing events, we are invited by the petitioners to consider and determine the constitutionality of the actions of the sergeant at arms together with the backup security of Uganda police and Uganda People's Defense Forces in evicting the said members of parliament. The respondent, on the other hand, argued that the actions of the Uganda police and Uganda People's Defense Forces were legal and demonstrated demo, demonstra, demonstra, Probably justified given the prevailing circumstances at the time whereby the members of parliament had turned rowdy, disruptive and violent and refused to leave the house despite the order. 
have perused the affidavit of Sergeant at Arms, Kagoye, where he described what happened. He said, I found it necessary to request and indeed requested the commandant of parliamentary police to stand ready to provide security backup in the chamber in the event that the sitting of 27th presents recurrence of the events of 26th and so on and so on. It's pertinent at this point to consider the powers conferred upon the speaker during proceedings. I have considered the contents of part 12 of the rules of procedure of Parliament, specifically rule 77 and 86 of the rules, and I'm inclined to accept the respondent submissions that the speaker is mandated and conferred with authority to maintain internal order and discipline in proceedings of Parliament by means which he considers appropriate for that purpose. This would ordinarily include power to exclude any member from Parliament for temporary periods where the conduct of actions of the member continuously cause any disruption or obstruction. I find that the speaker acted within the confines of her powers and, and given under those rules when she ordered the suspension. While I agree with the petitioner's submission that a member has a right to participate in proceedings to enable him or her to express the will of the people, this right is not absolute. And uh, my brother handled that issue, so I'll not dwell so much on it. Uh, but in my view, the question to be addressed is whether measures taken by sergeant at arms and the security offices, the security officers, security forces in, the, in implementing the order of the right honorable speaker were acceptable and demonstrably justifiable under article 433 of the constitution. Onyango Bo was referred to by my brother. And um, in my view, where the conduct of a member of parliament in, ex in the exercise of the aforesaid rights, as evident from the evidence on the record, is adverse to their mandate of parliament to conduct a debate and conclude the process of enacting any law. Such right may be curtailed as long as the limitation does not go beyond what is acceptable in a free and democratic society or what is provided in the Constitution within the context of Article 42. Um, uh, 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 upon my evaluation, I found that the affected member's right to fully participate was was curtailed, but I'm of the view that the curtailing of such rights did not amount to violation of Articles 1, 2, 3, 3, uh, 8A and 97 of the Constitution, as it was necessitated by their rather exceptionally unusual conduct, which was disdainful of the rules of Parliament and the orders of the Right Honourable Speaker. And the presence of the security forces was explained in the evidence of Kaguye. Uh, I've already mentioned his affidavit. The Chief of Defence Forces, General Mohose, also explained that the Army presence was necessitated by a call from the Inspector General of Police to offer backup force since they already had a permanent SFC establishment at Parliament suited for the treatment of VIP personnel who could be called upon to handle any emergency. And from the 
from the conduct of the members of parliament, which I have explained, um, I found that there was need for reasonable force to be used to ensure that order was restored within the presence of parliament. And on whether the army presence was justified, my view was that... Order, please. Order, order in the court. My view was that the forces that were set by the IGP could have been enough to contain the situation under the circumstances. There was no indication that the members of parliament causing the tumult were armed. Um, they, they, they were fighting, but without fire having been discharged, it could have been contained by the police alone. The deployment of the army, albeit from the permanent establishment at parliament, was in my view not justified. This is more so when the sergeant at arms did not request for the backup from the UPDF, even when they, he knew they had a permanent establishment at parliament. I also talked about when YouTube, UPDF can intervene, but I'll not, that is section 42 of the UPDF Act, but I'll not draw so much on it. You read it in the judgment. But the most important question to be answered would be whether the interference by the armed forces caused so much intimidation in the minds of the members of parliament that the ensuing process that led to the passing of the act was so impacted as to end up being a sham. I agree with the respondent through the clerk to parliament affidavit that the deployment of security forces under the command of the sergeant at arms was intended to assist him to carry out his duties as required by the rules of procedure and um, to stop any further disturbance of the debate um, the fact that UPDF came in did not in any way negate the justifiable nature of the backup intervention in the first place which was necessitated by the rowdiness and violence that engulfed the house that day and the unruly conduct of the previous sittings of parliament. Um, I'm of the view that the process leading to the enactment of the impugned act was not negatively impacted. Because from the Hansard reports, business went back to normal after the eviction of the offending members of parliament. And they, in fact, when the, the, the bill was passed, there was full house, as we saw. Issue 5 and 6, C therefore, are answered in the negative. I'll go to issue 6. Whether the entire process of conceptualizing, consulting, debating, and enacting the act was inconsistent with and in contravention of articles of the Constitution, as here under A, and I'll deal with A and B. Whether the introduction of the private members' bill that led to the act was inconsistent with, with and in contravention of Article 93, whether the passing of sections 2, 5, 6, 8, and 10 of the Act are inconsistent with and in contravention of articles, Article 93 of the Constitution. I've reviewed the, I've reviewed the affidavit of Mr. Keith Muhakanizi, and I do not, I, I do not accept the submission by Mr. Mavirizi and the prayer to expunge the, the paragraphs 5 and 8 of his affidavit. In paragraph 5, Mr. Mahakani stated his source of information and during cross-examination he explained that he was the accounting officer of the nation with sufficient knowledge to depend on the, ex the contents of his affidavit. Article 93 was referred to, was read out by my brother, so I will not read it.
From the record, at the time of presenting the Constitutional Amendment Bill, a, certi a certificate of financial implications dated 28 September was issued, certifying that the proposed amendments could be accommodated within the medium-term expenditure framework for the ministries, departments, and the agencies concerned. However, by the time of passing of the Constitutional Amendment Act, the original emergency bill had metamorphosed to include enlarging the period stroke life of Parliament and the government councils from five and four years, respectively, to seven, and an amendment for the restoration of, restoration of term limits. Uh, one of the questions to determine is the effect of the bill on the consolidated fund as regards money for consultation, as it was also raised, and money for payment of emoluments of members of parliament and local government councils for the extended period. In resolving the above, I have kept in mind that the main function of parliament is to make laws as enshrined in Article 79 of the Constitution, And Rule 2.1 of the Rules of Procedure of Parliament defines a bill to mean the draft of an Act of Parliament and includes both a private member's bill Numbers and a three. government bill. In this respect, I must respectively disagree with the Council for the respondent's submission that Article 93B could not have been contravened since it dealt with only motions or amendments of motions and the emergency bill was in Parliament. It is pertinent to note that the motion that was sought for was for purposes of leave to introduce the impugned bill. In search, search for and four others versus Attorney General, it's a Supreme Court case, it was restated that where the words are clear and unambiguous, they should be given their primary, plain, ordinary and natural meaning. But where the language is in, in, of the Constitution is imprecise, unclear, and ambiguous, the liberal, generous, and purposive interpretation should be applied. The wording of Article 93 is very clear that, except where presented on behalf of government, Parliament is precluded from considering a bill or motion for the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public fund of Uganda otherwise than reduction. And according to Black's Law Dictionary, a charge means to impose a burden, obligation, or a lien to create a claim against property, among others. I refer to Oloko Nyango for the proposition that Parliament as a lawmaking body should set standards for compliance with the constitutional provisions and its own rules, that the enactment of law is a process, and if one of the stages is flawed, it vitiates the entire process and the law that is enacted as a result of it. I also refer to another case of Troop versus Dallas for the same proposition. And um, I, I say that I've perused the bill as introduced by Majesi, and uh, I find that the proposed private member's bill in its original form, with this proposed four amendments, was not likely to impose a charge on the consolidated fund and was budget neutral as certified in the certificate of financial implications that accompanied the bill. However, I would not say the same for the amendments to the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 2, which reintroduced term limits and reentrenchment of the same, as well as increasing the life of Parliament and local government councils, which would, in my view, impose a charge on the consolidated fund. The amendments envisage different timelines for holding parliamentary and pre presidential elections, payment of emoluments to current members of parliament and members of the local government councils for two extra years, and huge costs 
of a referendum to be necessitated by the retrenchment of term limits. Clearly, such an important bill, heavily loaded as it was, ought to have been presented by government, but it was not. Neither was it presented on behalf of government. The bill in its final form therefore grossly contravened the provisions of Article 93. It raises the issue of budget framework process going beyond the normal five-year projection for the emoluments of members of parliament and local government councils. On whether payment of the 29 million to every member as facilitation for consultation contravened Article 93A. As my brother stated already, I also found that it did not contravene because the clerk to Parliament and uh, Keith Mukapanizi all depend that this is money that had already left the consolidated fund and was already allocated to the Parliamentary Commission. Accordingly, I found that the introduction of the private member's bill that led to the Constitution Amendment Act was not um, with regards to issue 6A I find that it wasn't in contravention of the stated articles and I find in the affirmative for issue 6B Issue 6D, whether consultations carried out were marred with restrictions and violence which were inconsistent with and or in contravention of Articles 29.1A, D, E, 29.2A of the Constitution. I will not go to the submissions. But this is how I resolve the matter. On the 16th day of October, a circular was issued think, by, it was issued and sent out to all regional police commanders, district commanders, and all police stations. My brother read it out already, so I'll not read it out. I say I'm carefully examining the above circular and other evidence plus arguments of counsel on either side of the issue. The assistant IGP as Mali Mujeni acknowledged issuing the circular referred to. and that it was to ensure that members of parliament did not consult outside their respective constituencies. The petitioners, however, complained that Articles 29.1 and 29.2 were thereby contravened. I set out the relevant articles which are allegedly contravened. My examination of the circular reveals that the instructions were directed within the police itself and not addressed to individual members of parliament. Um, the Uganda police force is enjoined under Article 212 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda to protect life and property, preserve law and order, prevent and detect crime. In the present case, there is evidence from affidavits of Win Honorable Win Kiza, Member of Parliament for Kasese, Honorable Dur, Jonathan, Member of Parliament for Erute County, South Constituency, that their consultative processes were interfered with. There are also some other, there is also evidence of uh, Honorable Sawanyana, MP March in the West, Honorable Kasivante, MP Ruvaga North, Honorable Katoru Buama.
No, there was evidence. No, she agreed with... No, no. Let me repeat that. There is evidence of Honorable Nikiza who deponed that. After the dispatch to consult as leader of opposition, she agreed with other members of parliament to carry out nationwide joint consultative meetings and rallies where she joined Honorable Sewanyana, Honorable Kasibante, Honorable Katoru Guama, Honorable Jack Wamai, Wamanga, to consult jointly in their areas. She averred that in all the above places, Police disrupted the consultations by beating, torturing, and using tear gas to disperse people, and as such, they envisaged participation, but uh, envisaged participation and consultation did not happen. Honorable Dur Jonathan. In his affidavit, he found that Honorable Tim Joy Ongong and Honorable Abachakon Angiro and Butamoy Chaos and some other MPs and himself were violently and unlawfully stopped from consulting people. Police dispersed people gathered at a, a dear division in Lira for consultations, even though the police had been notified of the intention to carry out joint consultation and consultations and the program had been forwarded. On the other hand, Honorable Katoto Hatui, MP for Katerera constituency, Honorable James Kaposa, MP for Kabula County, Honorable Moses Varieku, Honorable Lokeri Samson, Honorable Ngaro Obote Clement, Honorable and Honorable Msasizi, all depend in their affidavits in support of the answer to constitutional petition number three, that they carried out consultations in their constituencies in their respective districts, and the consultations were all peaceful. Now, what this court has to determine is whether the alleged police orchestrated violence affected the process of consultation and people participation, thereby also negatively impacting the enactment of Constitution Amendment Act 1 of 2018 in a substantial manner, such as to render the resultant act null and void. It's also important to decide whether the test to apply would be qualitative or quantitative or both. I refer to the Supreme Court Presidential Election Petition Number 1, 2001, Visa VSJ versus Joel K7 and the Electoral Commission, where a similar question arose under circumstances similar to the one cited in the present case, it was submitted for the petitioner that it was dangerous to use numbers to determine whether non-compliance affected the results, as it was a value judgment. Further, that non-compliance, for example, intimidation, lack of freedom, could not be quantified in numbers, and that numbers were only relevant for proving non-compliance. But for proving the effect, one had to look at the principles and values, the gravity, the climate, and the activities to see how they affected the results. Reliance was placed on the Tanzanian case of Attorney General versus Kaburu for the proposition that the underlying principle that elections should be free and fair meant that an election which was generally unfree and unfair was an election that was not an election at all as envisaged by the constitution and anything which rendered an election unfree and unfair was a valid ground to overturn the election mm -hmm. that was an election case but um odoki cj 
as he then was, held that very judgment as regards the effect of non-compliance of the results on the results was only relevant in considering the process of election and the principles underlying the process. He said that at the end of the elections, every judgment can be made that an election was not free and fair. But that's not the result of the election. It's only one of the principles of non-compliance which may render the election to be set aside if it has affected the result in a substantial manner. Quoting the Tanzanian case of Mbowe versus Elifu, the learned CJ went on to say that the other question to answer was whether the result that was said to be affected by irregularities in elections or non-compliance, whether the result was said to be affected by irregularities or non-compliance. And further, while defining the, fr the phrase affected by results of the elections, the court said, even if the burden rested on the respondent, I have come to the conclusion that evidence is all one way. Here, out of a total voting electorate of persons who recorded their votes, three or possibly four are shown by evidence to have voted without having a mark placed against their names. Even, even if one was to assume in favor of the petitioner that some proportion of the remainder of the 100 and so people whom we have not seen were somewhat similar, there does not seem to be a thread of evidence that there is such a substantial non-compliance with the provisions requiring a mark placed on the voter's name, and so on and so on. Odoki concluded that for the effect to be declared substantial, it must be calculated to really influence the results in a significant manner. Therefore, in order to assess the effect, the court has to evaluate the whole process of election. <coughs> it cannot be said that numbers were not important, first as the conditions which produce these numbers are useful in making adjustment for irregularities. The crucial point is that there must be cogent evidence, direct or circumstantial, to establish not only the effect of non-compliance or irregularities, but to satisfy court that the effect on the result was substantial. The principles in the above cases would, in my view, apply to the incidents of violence alluded to by the petitioners in the present petitions. From the evidence before court, some members of parliament depend that there was violence and disruption and consul of consultations, while others said that they held peaceful consultations. However, taking into account the results of the voting and the proceeding discussions where a majority of members of parliament reported peaceful consultations, I have not seen evidence cogent enough to show that the violence, intimidation, or absence of conditions of freedom and fairness affected the process that led to the passing of the impugned act and the eventual voting in the House. The results of the roll call voting after the third reading of the bill, as read out by the speaker, revealed that the absent members were only two, 62 were against, and 315 were in favor of the bill. And as such, the bill was declared passed into an act. The difference in the votes for and against is a very big margin. True court should, should apply both qualitative and quantitative tests. But the petitioners have failed on the quantitative side as they did not prove that the disruption, disruption cited did affect a substantive part of the country or had a substantive effect in the process. It's true that intimidation and harassment of the people gathered for consultation in some of the areas was proved to have occurred with intensities ranging from area to area. But, as indicated in uh, Kiza Vesige's case, it's not enough to prove that these mal malpractices occurred. Apart from proving the existence, the existence of those isolated incidents of violence and disruption, the petitioners also had to prove the degree and substantial effect which they had on the entire process up to the passing of the bill into the law. And with such overwhelming support which the bill received at the voting roll call stage, 
the effect of the consultative process can hardly be said to have been. The effect of the violence on the consultative process can hardly be said to have been fatal. Therefore, although the said violence and restrictions in themselves are to be condemned in the strongest terms, there is no evidence on the whole that the entire consultative process and the passing of the Act were adversely affected. Indeed, the incidents cited were too few to prove that consultations countrywide were not conducted under conditions of freedom and fairness. Accordingly, this ground of the petition must fail. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My, my sister has to cool her throat before continuing. Whether the alleged failure to consult on section 2, 5, 6, 8, and 10 is inconsistent with and in contravention of Article 18A of the Constitution, I think my brother handled this issue effectively. And uh, I really, what I have to add is here, you, you look at it, but I agreed with him that this issue should be answered in the affirmative. That with regard to those sections, there was inadequate or no consultation. I'll now handle 6, F, 9, and 10 together as they are all interrelated. Issue, issue 9, issue 6, F, is uh, whether the alleged failure to conduct a referendum before assenting to the bill containing sections 2, 5, 6, 8, and 10 of the Act was inconsistent with and in contravention of Articles 191, 1, 259.2, and 260.263.2b of the Constitution. And 9, whether the presidential assent to the bill allegedly in the absence of a valid certificate of compliance with the from the speaker and certificate of electoral commission that the amendment was approved at a referendum was inconsistent with and in contravention of Article 2632A and B of the Constitution. Issue 10, whether Section 5 of the Act, which introduces the term limits and entrenches them as subject to the referendum, is inconsistent with and in contravention of Article 262A of the Constitution. 262A of the Constitution. I began by... Laying out the provision 105, 105 tenure of office of the president, 91 exercise of legislation, Article 259 and 260 and 263, the ones which have been referred to. And I also saw on pages 5262. 5263 of the Hansard attached to the affidavit of Miss Jen Chibrigue 
the clerk to parliament indicating that during the second reading of the constitution amendment bill honorable nandala mafabi moved the motion and stated that he wanted to bring an amendment to article 105 to limit the terms of the president to two and also to have to entrench it as as chapter 7 article 10 and to entrench it as chapter 7 and also to to have it re-entrenched under article 260 under f to add it to 2 as f And Honorable Donga Oto, Ota, Oto, also said that it would be a good trade-off. The speaker thereafter put the question, he said, okay, Honorable Members, I put the question that the clause be further amended as proposed. The question put and amended. Section 5 of the Constitution Amendment Act provides, and I spell it down, um, I find that an entrenched clause or entrenchment clause of a basic law or constitution is a provision that makes certain amendments either more difficult or impossible to pass. Further, as earlier mentioned, in constitutional interpretation, the, where the language of the constitution is imprecise or, ambi uh, or ambiguous, then a liberal, flexible, and purposive interpretation must be given to cure the ambiguity. From the clear and unambiguous provisions of the Constitution Amendment Act, as well as the submissions of the petitioners and the answered, Article 105 was amended, 1052 was amended. According to the parliamentary answered, the intention of the legislature as passed by the Committee of the Whole House was to amend it as an entrenched article under Article 260 which article provides for a referendum I found that Parliament was within its mandate to amend the Constitution by creating an entrenched article having done so however provisions of article 260 had to come into play I do not I do respectfully not accept the submissions of the respondent as I find that Article 260 was indeed amended, under Article 256, amendment may be by way of addition, variation, or repeal as long as it's done in accordance with the Constitution. By amending Article 105 and making it entrenched under Article 262F, the latter was also amended. This necessitated a referendum, and since none was held, the amendment offends Article 261B. I'm not persuaded with the submission by the respondent that Article 260 was mentioned in the reports to the Committee of the Whole House in Error, and that by not including it verb verbatim in the Constitution Amendment Act, the clerk was correcting the error. With respect reference to the amendment to Article 105, when uh, Honorable Nandala moved to moved that the amendment be made and the speaker put the question and pronounced it was passed, the Attorney General sounded a warning which was not taken. The Attorney the Honorable Deputy Attorney General's pleas were ignored and the bill was passed without holding a referendum. There's a Canadian case, the Queen versus Big, Big Drug Mart Limited. Both purpose and effect are relevant in determining constitutionality. The purpose of amending Article 1052 and entrenching it was so that it would not be amended at will without participation of the people. 
By entering it, therefore, Article 260 was thereby amended. Um, I find that having amended Article 260, the provisions of 263 came into play. Certificate of compliance from the Speaker and Electoral Commission certifying that the referendum provision had been complied with should have been attached there to the assented bill. The certificate of compliance from the Electoral Commission was not attached since no such referendum was conducted or planned for and failure to attach the same annulled the amendment of Article 1052 and 260. Further still, having found on issues 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6E that section 2, 5, 6, 8 and 10 of the Constitution Amendment Act amended Articles 1 and 8A of the Constitution by infection, the said sections of the impugned Act could not have been validly passed without a referendum as stipulated under Article 260, since Article 1 is an infringed provision in itself. I accordingly find that the failure to conduct a referendum be first sent into the bill containing those sections 2, 5, 6, 8, and 10 of the Act was inconsistent with Article 191, 1, 2, 5, 9, 2, 260, and 263 of the Constitution. <coughs> Um, the certificate of the speaker was also a subject of complaint and my brother dealt with it. It only contained four clauses. It only mentioned the articles which were in the original bill or the Majesty bill. The rest were not mentioned. It's clear that the certificate of compliance issued by the speaker, which only included four articles and yet ten articles of the Constitution had be, were directly amended. Was not valid in their respect. It's however a mystery why the Speaker only chose to put just those in his certificate and yet they had passed 10 amendments. I'm accordingly inclined to agree with the petitioners that the presidential sent in respect of the amendments omitted from the certificate of compliance and the absence of the certificate from the electoral commission in respect of the amendments that required a, re a referendum was unconstitutional. The above provisions in the constitutions were indeed intended to save the president from signing something not legally passed by parliament. The speaker's certificate having referred only to four would further and of necessity mean that the omitted provisions were intentionally or otherwise, whether intentionally or otherwise, could not become law. I accordingly answer ground 6, F, 9, and 10 in the affirmative in respect to the articles not mentioned in the certificate. <laughs> Concerned. Accordingly, <laughs> answer ground Whether the Constitution was against the spirit and structure of the Constitution, that one also my brother tackled it. I'll not spend much time on it. Uh, except to mention that um, what I have to determine is whether the amendments in extending the term of parliament and local government councils and removal of age limits derogate from this basic structure. I've talked about it. Uh, 
And I have to consider whether the amendments pro promote sovereignty of the people or effectively curtail it or surrender their power to parliament or to the president. Parliament under section, under article 79.1 is empowered to make laws on any matter for peace, order, development and good governance. In doing this, they act as people's representatives. However, the ultimate power belongs to the people, although some of it is delegated to members of parliament. Uh, I've already mentioned in earlier, earlier in my judgment that the amendments under 2, 6, 8, and 10 were null and void, they related to the extension of the terms of parliament and local councils. They did effectively derogate from the basic structure in that parliament usurped the people's power to express their will to consent on who shall govern them and how they should be governed through regular free and fair elections of their representatives or through a referendum. The two-year the two year extension was not sanctioned by the people, the members represent, and having done it once, if not checked in time, nothing would stop Parliament from doing the same again without reference to the people in contravention of the Constitution. Further, citizens who had hoped to contest after five years would have their rights to participate in elections, politics, in elective politics, dashed. They would have had much longer to wait. So this would, in my view, cause instability. So it would really go against the basic structure. The removal of the age limit for the president and local government councils would not, in my view, derogate from the basic structure. Article 102 is not an entrenched provision. The amendment does not infect Article 1 or any of the mentioned articles that form the basic structure through the removal of age limit may encourage an incumbent to wish to keep himself in office perpetually, but the citizens still retain the power to either return the same president or elect a different one. Citizens are even more encouraged to aspire to elect a leader of their choice. And for those who have either to be dormant to actively participate in politics and elections, I resolve this issue in the affirmative only as far as section 268 and 10 are concerned. Whether alleged failure by parliament to observe its own rules of procedure, order, that is order, issue please. 7. Can we order in the court? Issue 7. Whether the alleged failure by Parliament to observe its own rules of procedure during the enactment of the Act was inconsistent with and in contravention, in contravention of Article 28, 42, 44, 92, 93C and 94-1 of the Constitution. Um, leaving out the submissions, I'll go to the order paper. I read the record and the record and reviewed the evidence on how the Constitution Amendment Bill 2017 found its way on the order paper. Parliament has power to make rules of procedure which are intravious the Constitution. The issue of smuggling, Honorable Majesty's motion to the order paper arose from the said motion having been received by the office of the De Deputy Speaker on 21st 17. And it was given precedence of over Honorable Patrick Nsamba. Is it Nsamba? Nsamba. Nsamba. Mm. Patrick Nsamba's motion seeking to constitute 
a constituent assembly which had been received earlier on 18th September. And Honorable Dom, uh, Sam, Dr. Sam Liomoki, which had also been received earlier on 21st September. Rule 120 of the Rules of Procedure provide for a private member's bill and 121 for the procedure. Honorable Samju Nganda responded in his affidavit that the speaker had acted contrary to the ruling of the deputy speaker and amended the order paper by including Honorable Majesty's private member's bill. And this was in a contravention of the constitution, the, of the rules, of the rules of procedure of parliament, which were stated. In reply, the clerk to parliament deponed that under the rules of procedure, the speaker had the authority to determine the order of business of the house. And the motion introduced by a private member to introduce a bill took priority over the motion that Honorable Bonsamba intended to introduce. I further note that the Shadow Minister for Constitutional Affairs asked the Speaker why she was prioritizing Majesty's bill over Samba's bill, but she ignored him. The hazard attached to the affidavit of uh, Honorable, no, affidavit of Miss Jane Chibirige recorded how the motions came. I'll not read it out. And then the members on pages 4735 onwards, members complained. Honorable Segona complained why this should be so, why the treat speaker should treat their own as such. And it's clear from the above extracts that the Majesty motion came after Honorable Patrick Nsamba, Nsamba's motion. <coughs> the Speaker informed Parliament that both motions had passed Rule 47 and qualified to be added on the order paper. I agree with the respondent that the motion by Honorable Patrick Nsamba did not have a draft bill attached to it, contrary to Rule 121 of the Rules of Procedure of Parliament. Nonetheless, by the time the proceedings of Parliament started, the motion by Honorable Majesty was not on the said order paper. It was included without giving members of parliament the mandatory notice of three hours. They were, in my view, ambushed with the inclusion of Honorable Majesty's motion in the order paper. The speaker knew this and her assertion that members had notice and yet one of them had informed her otherwise shows that she intentionally ignored the advice of the members. Mm -hmm. to uh, and when they sat, she proceeded and let Honorable Majesty present his motion. I refer to Samuel Gerere that Parliament should follow their own procedure. I know that putting Honorable Majesty's bill onto the order paper ahead of the earlier one went against the rules of procedure of Parliament. Nonetheless, it was only Honorable Majesty's motion that had a proposed draft of the bill attached to it. Honorable Samba's bill, which was filed prior, did not have a proposed draft bill, contrary to Rule 121. I accordingly hold the view that failure to abide to the, by the, to abide to the particular rule did not in any way affect the process or the eventual outcome, which is the Constitution Amendment Act since the members of parliament went ahead to debate and pass the bill with the amendment, amendments. Issue 7A, whether actions of parliament preventing some members of public from accessing parliamentary chambers during the presentation of constitutional amendment bill was inconsistent. My brother tackled that. I think it's uh, honorable, uh, it's uh, Mr. Mabirizi. Complaint? Hmm? So, I'm 
looking. Yeah. I'm just looking. Looking at where I concluded. Um, I agree with my brother. I find that, that, that restricting entry to the gallery, inconveniencing as it may have been to the members of the public, did not negatively impact the process ending in the passing of the Const Constitution Amendment Bill. There is issue 7B, 7C, and 7E, whether the act of tabling the, the bill in absence of the leader of opposition and chief whip and other members of opposition of the of opposition was in contravention of the stated articles whether alleged actions of the speaker permitting the ruling party members to sit on the position the opposition side of parliament was inconsistent whether the alleged act of the speaker of parliament in allowing chairperson of legal affairs committee to present a report mm -hmm in the absence of the leader of opposition were also inconsistent uh, and whether the actions of the speaker in suspending six members of parliament was in contravention i i agree with the, the submissions the findings and conclusions of my brother cheborion and i don't think i would really spend much time on this um, and issue 7D, whether the alleged act of the legal and parliamentary affairs committee of parliament in allowing some committee members to sign after the public hearings of the Constitutional Amendment Bill, I also similarly agree with my brother. I may have some different reasons, some additional reasons which you read in my judgment. Uh, and then, issue uh, eight, is it the next one? Am I not missing out? Ah. Issue 7G, whether the action of Parliament in waiving the requirement of a minimum of three sittings from the tabling of the report, yet it was not seconded, closing the debate on a Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 2 before every member of Parliament could debate failing to close all doors and voting. I um, have my reasons here, but in essence, I agree with my brother in his conclusions. The reasons will be read in my judgment. Now, I'll turn to issue 8, which, you are, which I'll handle with issue 7G or 4. Issue 8, whether the passage of the Act without observing 14 sitting days of Parliament between second and third reading was inconsistent with and in contravention of Articles 262 and 263, the Constitution. 7G4, whether the action of Parliament in failing to separate the second and third reading by at least 14 sitting days are inconsistent with and in contravention of Articles 18A and 44C, 79, 94, 263 of the Constitution. Uh, Again, I'll agree with my brother. My reasons will be found in the judgment. But the conclusion of my brother, I accept. And, um, Can we have only one person speaking? There's only one judgment being delivered. Hmm? 
That, that tete -tete of yours, that's no place here. <coughs> and on the question what would, hap what would happen to the remaining provisions which did not require a mandatory separation of 14 days, I also agree with my brother that severance is accepted. They can be severed nothing that prevents them from being severed. Issue 11, whether Section 9 of the Act which seeks to harmonize Did I, did I miss out any? Did I miss out? What have been the age limit? Ah, okay. Whether Section 9 of the Act, which seeks to harmonize the seven-year term of Parliament with, presidential, with the presidential term is inconsistent with and or in, in con, contravention of Articles 1051 and 262. Um, from my findings, I, I think I, I first... Spelled out the provisions, section eight and nine. But actually, I came to the same conclusion with my brother. Then I go to to issue twelve. I think I'll have to read it out. Whether section three and seven of the Act lifting the age limit are inconsistent with and in contravention of Articles 21, 3, and 21, 5 of the Constitution. I consider the submissions from either side. Petition has argued that sections 3 and 7 of the Constitution were inconsistent with and or in contravention of Articles 21 and, 3, 21, 3 and 5. On the other hand, the respondent argued that people should be given the right to choose how they should be governed regardless of age limit. The petitioners had referred to, the, to Article 21, which talks about equality and freedom from discrimination. And it talks about the purposes of this article, discrimination, discriminate means to give different treatment to different persons attributable only or mainly to their respective descriptions by sex, race, color, ethnic, origin, tribe, birth, creed, or religion, social or economic standing, political opinion, or disability. Notwithstanding, nothing shall be taken to be inconsistent with this article which is allowed to be done under any provision of this constitution. Equality and freedom from discrimination, this is my finding, is not absolute or boundless, even in the most demo democratic society. Instead, limitations may be imposed on that freedom from discrimination, which strike a balance. The general standard set for testing the permissible limitations is contained in Article 43. From reading of the above article, I note that from reading the above article, the one referred to by the petitioners, I find that age is not one of the attributes that constitute discrimination in Uganda. Further, even if it were, under Article 43 2C of the Constitution, public interest shall not permit any limitation of enjoyment of the rights and freedoms prescribed by this chapter beyond what is acceptable and demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society or what is provided for in the Constitution. And the meaning of demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society was discussed in Onyango Bo versus Attorney General. And um, 
which was also discussed by the Constituent Assembly. Very thoroughly. Democracy is a fundamental constitutional value and principles and principle co constitutional value and principle in Uganda. The preamble to the constitution declares that people of Uganda are committed to establishing a social, economic, and political order through a popular, durable national constitution. Provisions relating to the fundamental human rights should be given purposive and generous interpretation in such a way as to secure maximum enjoyment of rights and provisions as per the case of Tinyafuza. I also consider the preamble to the Constitution um, one of the terms of the the Constitutional Review Commission attached to the affidavit of Frederick Sempewa in Constitutional Petition Number 5. One of the terms of reference was to review the qualifications and disqualifications of members of Parliament and the President. And, particular article, and in particular, Article 81, 81 and C, and Article 102, in order to make appropriate recommendations. Age limits were, however, not part of the recommendations. Uh, neither had they been so in the Odoki report. The Constitution, however, came up with age limits. It's uh, stated by the petitioners that effecting the amendments would be discriminatory and would affect other public officers, for example, judiciary. Article 143 and 144, and Chapter 10 on the public service, on which there is limitation of age imposed. I'm unable to agree with this as a strong argument against lifting of the age limit in respect of the president and the local government councils. This is because the president and the councils are political offices and the office bearers are elected and not appointed, like in the case of judges and public servants. I would relate the amendment to other political offices where there is no age limit. For example, members of parliament. It is possible, as I indicated earlier, that removal of term limits, especially in, in the circumstances of Uganda, would uh, encourage the incumbents to stay on power, but the power to decide who governs or rules them, or rules the people, shall always remain with the people who exercise it through regular general elections. The people's power to elect a president or district person of their choice is not taken away by lifting the, the respective age limits, if anything. As I said, citizens would be encouraged to aspire more to um, engage in politics. Most importantly, the role of the court, of this court, is to determine whether the amendments in the Constitution Amendment Act did contravene any of the provisions of the Constitution from the, of the Constitution. And from the issues I've not found Section 3 and 7 among the ones that have offended or contravened the Constitution. The Constitution. Articles 102 and 181 are not among the entrenched articles and the amendment did not infect any other provisions of the Constitution. Section 102 was listed in the Speaker's Certificate as one of those being amended where many others were left out. The people's sovereignty and freedom to choose who will govern them under Article 1 was not affected or infected. I will answer this issue in the negative. Whether the continuance of the office by the President elected in 2016 and remains in office upon attaining age of 75 years, contra contravenes Article 83.1b and 105 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. I uh, think like my brother said, 
clear in the above article refers to the qualifications for election as president. Question of age is only restricted to the time of the election. The president could legally be elected when he was 40. He could have been legally elected when he was 40, 74 years and 11 months. And that would mean that he would legally rule till the age of 79. I find no merit in this issue. And I declare so. The remedy is available. My brother also tackled a lot on this. I found that the petition had merit and succeeded in respect of se several provisions of the Act, which have declared null and void. I further noted that it involved extensive research and lengthy submissions. Uh, however, note that the respondent also successfully defended portions of the Act which have been held to have been validly passed. But I'll order that the petitioners be granted some professional fees and costs to cover disbursements. Like my brother said, the, the general damages and the interest were not proved. In the result, this petition partially succeeds. I find and declare as follows. Sections 2, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10 of the Constitution Amendment Act, Act 1 of 218, are in contravention and or inconsistent with 1995 Constitution of Uganda and should be expunged from the Constitution of Uganda Sections one, three, four. Yeah, Section. Should I repeat number one? Yes. yes. We are part. <laughs> what, about, <laughs> what about? Have you heard? The, the letter that the general had, but the others are not. Okay. <laughs> Sections two, five, six, eight, nine, and ten of the Constitution Amendment Act, Act one of twenty eighteen. <laughs> I are in contravention and or inconsistent with the 1995 Constitution of Uganda and should be expunged from the Constitution of Uganda. Uh, sections 1, 3, 4, and 7 of the Constitution Amendment Act, 1 of 2018, are not inconsistent with and or in contravention of the 1997 Constitution. As to costs, I too will award costs in the terms set out in the judgment of my brother, Honorable Justice Cheborion Barishaki. <coughs> Dated at Imbale today, the 26th of June of July, 2018, and signed by me. Thank you, uh, my sister, Lady Justice Elizabeth Musoke. Uh, court will be stood over for five minutes. One, two, three, four, five. So the justices will walk back in five minutes. I advise that you stay put because we will not wait for anyone who's gone out. Thank you. <laughs> I see patients who come to me suffering from infectious diseases caused by germs from typhoid to diarrhea, flu and cough. An average human being comes in contact with over 1 million germs daily. When we use the toilet, from our door handles, from other surfaces, and we transfer to others without realizing. Germs are inevitable. 
That is why we recommend Dettol Antiseptic Liquid. Use the power of Dettol's one cupful to protect your family with our best germ protection ever for bathing, for cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, for cuts and wounds. Be Dettol sure. I do not have to worry about unplanned bills 